Welcome to worship. I'm Deirdre Spencer, also known as D. What I like about our church is the opportunity that it provides for individuals to express themselves musically, be it through the chancel choir, the Asbury Ringers, or the praise band at Greenwood. Well, welcome to worship. I am Pastor Nick Berlanga. I am the associate pastor here at Ann Arbor First, and I am so glad that you are here with us. Um, today, Reverend Nancy is at seminary, so she won't be with us. However, the Wesley chaplain, our friend Tim Kobler, is here. Tim? It's so wonderful to be able to worship together with you this weekend, and i um, wanted to let you know the next weekend is Memorial Weekend. And so there will be a, a separate garden service online in addition to the regular recorded worship service. And there's an opportunity to give to the Memorial Garden planting. So if you're intending to give to that, it is due by May 26th. And the link can be found in the latest news. And then the following weekend is the Michigan Annual Conference. And so we will be having a lay-led worship service. And if you are interested in being involved in that worship service, contact Carol DeHart. And because of that also, communion, which would normally be held on June 6th, will be held on June 13th. So yes. Nick, back to you. Thank you, Tim. And thank you for the reminder about communion. Now, we would love to know that you are worshiping with us. So if you are on the website or watching us on YouTube, there's a link. Go ahead, click on that, fill out the information. We'll know that you are here, and it'll give us an opportunity to get your feedback on the worship service. We're always looking for ways to improve. With that being said, let's go ahead and worship. Get ready. Enjoy.
Praise be to God for the gift of loving one another. Praise be to God for the gift of serving one another. Even now, God's Holy Spirit is animating us, setting us in motion to bring about God's justice and peace. God's Spirit fills us so that we may speak the truth with boldness, dream God's dreams, and see a vision of new possibilities. Our lives are enriched by these gifts from God. Praise be to God that we are bound together as one by the Holy Spirit who gives us these gifts. Today's scripture is from Colossians chapter 3, verse 12 to 17. Because you are God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with heartfelt compassion, with kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with one another. Forgive whatever grievances you have against one another. Forgive in the same way God has forgiven you. Above all else, put on love, which binds the rest together and makes them perfect. Let Christ's peace reign in your hearts, since as members of the one body, you have been called to that peace. Dedicate yourselves to thankfulness, let the word of Christ, rich as it is, dwell in you. Instruct and admonish one another wisely. Sing gratefully to God from your hearts in, in psalms, hymns, and songs of the Spirit. And whatever you do, whether in speech or in action, do it in the name of Jesus our Savior giving thanks to God through Christ. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God. Hey guys, thanks for joining me today. Today we're gonna to talk about compassion. And compassion is thinking about what it's like to be another person. It's thinking about the struggles that another person might be going through and then giving care and love to that person because we understand what their struggle might be, okay? So we're gonna do a quick activity to better understand how we can find compassion for people, okay? So we're gonna work on putting ourselves in the, another person's shoes. So you each have your shoes in front of you and you have a paper heart with your name on it. Switch your shoes and your heart and give it to one of your siblings. Now go ahead and put your sibling's shoes on and then hold your sibling's heart in your hand. Okay, during our activity, your job is to try to understand what it might be like to be your sibling. I'm gonna share some phrases or things that might be said to your sibling in our family. And if you think that phrase is hurtful or could be hurtful, fold your heart in half, okay? Liam, you're wearing Grayson's shoes and holding Grayson's heart. Here are some phrases Grayson might have heard over the years. Grayson, what are you talking about? You make no sense. Grayson, that is not right. You're being dumb. Grayson, you're so annoying. I don't like it when you play with my friends and me. Okay, Lila, you're wearing Liam's shoes and holding Liam's heart. Liam, do you even know how to listen? Liam, you're such a baby. Why won't you play this game with us? Liam, you're not that good at soccer. I'm way better than you. Okay, Grayson, you're wearing Lila's shoes and holding Lila's heart. Lila, why are you so weird? You read all the time in your room. Do you think that would be hurtful? Maybe. Then you need to do what? Well. Yep. 
Lilo, what is wrong with you? Why don't you like to compete and swim? We all like to compete. Lila, why can't you just have more friends like we do? Okay, now everybody unfold the heart of your sibling. Do the hearts have wrinkles in it from all the hurtful face phrases? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the hearts are a little bit more beaten up. It can show some of the struggles, right? So Liam, how do you think it feels to be Grayson when he hears those things? Hurtful. You think he feels hurt? Mm -hmm. What do you think it might be like to be the youngest in a big family? Um, not being able to like compete as much. Like always feeling like you're not good enough to yeah. keep in there? Yeah, I can see that. Well, how do you think Liam might feel when he hears phrases like that? Um, upset or sad. Upset or sad? What do you think it's like being Liam in our family with an older brother and a younger brother? Um, probably hurt and um, hard to try to fit in or? Yeah, hard to fit in being the middle child, never being quite good enough to the top and always trying to compete with the smaller younger brother. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And Grayson, how do you think Lila feels when she hears those things? Really, really sad. Yeah. And what do you think it's like for Lila and her family to not like sports and to like different things? Not included. Yeah, she might not feel included. She might feel left out or like her things aren't important. Yeah. I think those are really good ideas. You guys did a really good job trying to understand each other. And when we try to understand each other and what each person might be going through, that's compassion. And based on understanding each other, we can love each other better because we understand that each of us has our own struggle in the family or in life. Does that make sense to you guys? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So remember that Jesus taught us this, right? He taught us above all else to love one another and to try to understand rather than judge or critique people, right? So finding compassion is part of our humanity of being human and trying to love each other better. Okay, let's pray. Dear God, thank you for sending us your son, Jesus, to remind us to love one another, to remember that we are human, and to remember to be kind and try to understand that each of us has our own struggle in life. We're each climbing our own mountain. Help us to look to you for guidance, and to be pure in our heart, to offer compassion and love to those around us. Amen.
If you saw me dressed like this, you'd have a pretty good idea about what was on my agenda for the day. Or, if you see me dressed like this, you have a pretty good guess about what I'm about to be doing. Or when I'm dressed like this, you have a pretty good idea what I'm about to do. Now, when the writer of this letter to the church at Colossae was thinking about this community, there were lots of things at play. It was a very diverse community and a very large city that had a lot of flow in and out from around the known world at the time. And so in this community, there were people who had very differing philosophies. There were some who had very different theologies. There wasn't one set of beliefs upon which this community um, based its life of faith upon. One of the big issues that the writer senses in this community and has heard about is that there are some in the community who consider themselves true Christians, true believers, and then that there are others in the community who are not, particularly those who come from a Greek or Gentile background, unless they became first Jewish and then Christian, they were not considered true believers. And this was a, a very large argument to the point where people felt displaced in their faith. And so this writer is addressing this community and trying to remind them about what being a follower of Christ is all about. It's not necessarily about assent to any one philosophy. It's not believing just one correct set of beliefs, but rather it is taking on the characteristics of Christ upon whom the church is founded. And these are characteristics that the people of the church are supposed to put on like garments like they are setting out to do the task of living a life of faith. And so what is listed in this reading that they are to clothe themselves with are compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. And it seemed like in this particular community those were in short supply and they needed to be reminded about those characteristics of Christ that are above and beyond anything else in importance in the community of faith. In order to be known as a follower of Christ, one needs to take on those characteristics of Christ. What we saw in Jesus' life was not that he judged people because they didn't believe just the right way or didn't come from just the right place, but rather Jesus was compassionate and patient and humble and gentle with all of the people that were living on the margins, those who were pushed to the edges of society. And in this church community, at the church at Colossae, they needed to be reminded that these are the very things that they needed to be about as well. Compassion is what we're looking at today as our pillar of joy. This, taken together with all of the others that we've already talked about, help to prepare oneself for a life of faith and joy. Compassion literally means to suffer with. Frederick Buechner put it very poignantly in his book, Wishful Thinking and later in Beyond Words, when he says that compassion is the capacity for feeling what it's like to live inside someone else's skin. It's the knowledge that there can never be really any peace and joy for me until there is peace and joy finally for you, too. The Dalai Lama puts it similarly in the Book of Joy, Lasting Happiness in, in a Changing World, when he says that we should seek to be an oasis of caring and concern as we live our lives. So the key problem is that they've forgotten some of these deep-seated characteristics of who Christ is and who they are called to be. We look at the example of Jesus' life, how in the prologue to John's Gospel, we hear how the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Jesus was what God looked like walking around in sandals in the Near East. 
stepped fully into humanity with all of its joy and all of its sorrows, with all of its strengths and weaknesses, with its hopes, with its aspirations, the full experience of humanity. He saw the people who were like sheep without a shepherd and taught them on the mountainside in Matthew's gospel. He spent time with those who were deemed unclean or unsuitable. In fact, he also spent time with those who were on the other end of the spectrum, trying to speak truth to power to those who were scribes or Pharisees or in other positions of authority, to remind them of God's command that we should love the Lord our God with all that we have and to love our neighbors as ourselves. He helped to provide those who were in need with what it was that they hungered for. I think about the stories of Jesus feeding the multitudes and how they were gathered there, and he saw that they were hungry, he had compassion on them, and wanted to do something about it. And so the miracle of the feedings of the 4,000 and the 5,000 are recorded in our gospel stories. He challenged systems of oppression. And it got him into no small amount of trouble. But he saw the deep need of all people and stepped into the situation with his own body to speak love and grace and compassion into those moments. In our own denominational history of United Methodism, there is this concept that we have called the social gospel, where the good news of God speaks to the needs of the world and it puts compassion into action through advocacy for education, workers' rights, ending child labor, abolitionist efforts. Wesley, by the way, was firmly against slavery, but Methodists have unfortunately stood on both sides of that issue, and there's a long history about that and issues of addiction. They visited people in the prisons and and would associate with people that the church authorities would say, don't spend time with them, you're going to get in trouble. But they saw it as a moral imperative to be compassionate people meeting others at the point of their need. The Dalai Lama says the problem is that our world and our education remain focused exclusively on external materialistic values, sort of like what we see explained in the book of Colossians. We're not concerned enough with inner values. Those who grow up with this kind of education live in a materialistic life, and eventually the whole society becomes materialistic. But the culture is not sufficient to tackle our human problems. The real problem is here and here. The mind and the heart. So as we begin to engage in these pillars of joy and let them inform one another, perspective and compassion and forgiveness and and all of these things working together, it helps us in our work of care for one another. And in doing so, then, the peace of Christ then can rule in our hearts and bring us a joy that is beyond our own efforts. This is one of the gifts that the Holy Spirit brings to the community of Christ. As we begin to live into the giftedness of who God has made us to be, It brings us joy because it connects us one to another. We enjoy one another's company. We challenge one another to grow. We meet one another at our needs. And we have a shared love for each other. And in all of that comes this joy, this confidence that a better day is still ahead. So where is compassion needed today for us? Well, the list for us is tremendously long. I can't begin to list them all, but we've been talking a lot about issues of anti-racism and our need as a congregation and as a Wesley Foundation to look at the ways in which we can act more faithfully and compassionately toward everyone, to leave our bias behind 
and to practice radical welcome, acceptance, inclusion, celebration, celebration of all that each of us brings, and not feeling that I am better than anyone else or that anyone else is lesser because of any condition. Standing against apartheid and acts of genocide, which we see happening in so many places, but we're seeing it played out on our news screens between Israel and Palestine right now. How aggression against a people is not what God is wanting at all. And as a community of Christ, we are to stand in solidarity with those who are oppressed and to speak truth to the powers of oppression to say, enough is enough. The ongoing struggle for women's rights, gender equity, LGBTQ plus inclusion, economic justice, access to health care, efforts for adequate and just compensation. The list goes on and on and on. It can be overwhelming, in fact. There is such a thing as compassion fatigue because we see that there's so much going on that we feel overwhelmed and thus feel like there's nothing that we can do. Or we feel completely exasperated. As we take on these characteristics of Christ, practicing our faith through acts of compassion and gentleness and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience, we also need to look at the example of Christ through the gospel stories. Otherwise, we feel like we're becoming a doormat and just completely wiped out by trying to address it all. Jesus set very important standards for self-care in the midst of his life of compassion. Jesus set healthy boundaries by taking time away to rest, to regroup, to refresh, to have time in prayer, to really have time for discernment about what is most needful now and what did he have to offer for that moment. Jesus, also seeing the need, delegated some of the work that needed to be done. In those stories where Jesus fed the multitudes, we see that he tells the disciples, you give them something to eat. He knew that the disciples needed something to do as well, and they had the resources at hand, even though they didn't see it at first. And when joined together with the efforts of Jesus, the crowd was blessed with an abundance of food. We also see this in the gospel story where Jesus sends out the 70 disciples to do ministry in his name in the surrounding world. And they were amazed by some of the things that happened because there they went in the power of the Spirit and they saw the work of Christ being done. And there were times where Jesus had to set healthy boundaries by letting people go. When Jesus met the rich young person, they asked what they must do to inherit eternal life. Jesus said what was needful. And when they weren't able to accept that and make that a part of who they need to be, Jesus let them walk away. We cannot be responsible for the actions of everyone else. We can only be responsible for ourselves. So this life of compassion is being aware of what's going on, knowing what our resources are, having the heart to get involved and to put our skin in the game, to stand up, to protest, to speak out, to love, to be where the people are that need to know that they are loved. But it's not being a doormat. It's knowing when we need to step back and to pray and to rest, to regroup, to prioritize. Ultimately, though, in the midst of all of this, joy is the reward. The Dalai Lama says, the joy, joy is the reward really of seeking to give joy to others. When you show compassion, when you show caring, when you show love to others, doing things for others, in a wonderful way, you have a deep joy that you can get in no other way. 
You can't buy it with money. You can be the richest person on earth, but if you care only about yourself, I can bet my bottom dollar, he says, that you will not be happy and joyful. But when you are caring, compassionate, more concerned about the welfare of others than about your own, wonderfully, wonderfully, you suddenly begin to feel a warm glow in your heart because you have, in fact, wiped the tears from the eyes of another. In that moment, you have become an oasis of caring and concern as you live your life. So as we go into these coming days, as we think about the ways in which that Pentecost Spirit of God empowers us for service, meeting people where they are, speaking in a language that they can understand, daring to step out of our safe spaces to take on the ministry of Christ, how is it that you are being called? What gifts are you being given to live these lives of compassion? to lay aside the differences between us and to lay the love of Christ into the lives of others. It's my prayer that we will breathe deep the breath of God. Let that holy wind set us in motion like feeding and fanning the flames of a fire so that it warms up all around and we can all have joy in Christ. May it be so. Amen. I'm Beth Lipton, and I'm here to tell you about our church's upcoming host week at Alpha House, June 7th to 13th. Before I do anything else, though, I would like to thank everyone for their amazing support of the Family Homeless Shelter throughout the pandemic. We've had four host weeks, and for everyone, we've provided varied and delicious dinners and all of the supplies they needed, even when that involved 40 rolls of toilet paper and eight containers of Lysol and Microban when those things were impossible to find. I'm speaking to you particularly about this host week because our June week has always been the most difficult to find volunteers. Summer vacations are starting and now that things are getting a bit back to normal, school's ending, people are hoping to travel. It's, been, it's always a difficult week to find volunteers. So now is the time to help if you've ever thought about doing it. Alpha House has been very careful in following all COVID precautions. Because of the amazing support of their in-house staff and the families who have been very cooperative, who are living there, there have been no active cases of COVID throughout the pandemic. They are still following their contactless delivery protocols, which means any delivery is left outside in front of Alpha House on a cart. That plus the fact that our, uh, we, no long, we don't have connections at church to collect supplies means we're going to have to purchase supplies from a fund and have them delivered to Alpha House. If you're interested in helping with a supply fund, please go to the church website, to the donation page, select Alpha House from the drop down menu and make the donation. We still need uh, meals for our evenings. If you're interested in supplying all or part of a meal, or if you would like to donate money toward purchasing a meal provided by a local restaurant to be delivered by them, all or part of a meal, please contact me. My information, email and phone will be at the end of the presentation. One thing that has changed at Alpha House, now that things are getting a little bit better, is that they're starting to have after dinner kids activities. 
These uh, occur every night after dinner for about an hour, starting at 6.45 to 7. It will be outside on their very well-equipped playground. People will be able to wear masks or not, depending on what they're comfortable with. Uh, there will be a small number of children because Alpha House's schedule is now more flexible. There'll be one to five kids there. Families are w welcome to come. You can bring your kids. You do not have to supply activities. There are more than enough things there to keep the kids very busy and happy. I want to thank you again on behalf of the homeless families at Alpha House for your generosity throughout the pandemic and to wish you all a happy, safe, and almost normal spring and summer. Thank you very much. God calls us to create a community of compassion. And one way that we do that is in what we give to the church because we enable the church's ministries and the growth of our children into compassionate people as well. So I invite you now to give your offering to the church. You can do that online by going to the church's website and clicking on give. And as you're doing that, I also encourage you to reach out to someone in the church or in your family, someone you haven't connected with. Pass the peace by a text or an email just to let them know you're thinking of them. Thank you.
Let us join together in a time of prayer. O oh, Holy God, what a blessing to worship with one another today. We come with hearts full of praise and thanksgiving for your love and steadfastness. We still bask in the words of Easter, Christ is risen, that create such hope within. We are thankful for the arrival of spring and signs of new life blooming and budding around us. The colors of life are bursting forth in flowers, plants dormant from the winter, and the smallest winged birds at our feeders. We rejoice with the increasing daylight hours and the lightness of spirit that comes with it and we breathe in calm with increasing vaccination numbers and significantly lower hospitalizations due to COVID. And for all of this, we give you thanks. Through these past months, it is this community and congregation which have sustained us, a community bonded in our faith, our belief, that you are our God and we are your people. Because you, O oh God, are the beginning and the end, the Alpha and Omega, our creator and source of life, and the Holy One who greets us at the end of life's journey. It is impossible to find words sufficient to express our love and gratitude, and yet we still try. We are grateful for the many gifts you have given us, yet we look around our world and acknowledge areas where we as humans struggle. Empower us to formulate plans of vaccine distribution that reach the most isolated and vulnerable. Give us strength to reduce the polarizing divide in our nation. Grant wisdom and the ability to participate in respectful discussions at national, state, and local levels of government. Bring peace to the Middle East quickly, for all life is precious. Like the disciples and early church on Pentecost so long ago, may we too be aflame with your love. Light a fire in our souls to share your kingdom with others. Let love carry us into the world to be the hands and feet of your ministry. Heighten our awareness that when we are rejoicing, we remain conscious of those who are in pain, hungry, without homes, suffering injustice, or victims of violence. Prepare and enable us as a church and individuals to respond and alleviate suffering. Let compassion always be our guide. 
All these things we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hello, my name is Nancy Quay. As chairperson of the Staff Parish Relations Committee of First United Methodist Church of Ann Arbor, I have the responsibility to announce a modification of appointment for Pastor Nick Berlanga. As you know, Pastor Nick has been serving full-time as our associate pastor since July 1, 2018. Beginning this July 1, Pastor Nick will serve half-time as the associate pastor here at Ann Arbor First and a quarter time at Canton Cherry Hill UMC and a quarter time at Ypsilanti St. Matthews UMC. These appointments have been made by our Bishop, David Bard, in consultation with the Cabinet of the Michigan Conference. The decision to appoint Pastor Nick occurred after considerable prayer, discussion, and discernment. Pastor Nick has agreed to accept these appointments. As United Methodists, we affirm with faithful understanding that we, the Church, are the body of Christ. It is Christ's sustaining spirit that will guide us in the days ahead. We will trust and rely on Christ's presence and grace during this time of transition. In the coming weeks, Pastor Nick will begin packing to move into the parsonage provided by Ypsilanti State St. Matthews. Please hold Pastor Nick in prayer during this time of transition. Pray, too, for the whole cabinet, including Bishop David Bard, as they continue to meet, pray, and discern God's will in the appointment-making process. We trust in God's amazing grace, Christ's faithful love, and the presence and power of the Holy Spirit as we move into the future. Please join me in congratulating Pastor Nick on these next exciting steps in his theological and spiritual journey. Thank you. Go out into the world and work to bring forth new life. Dream dreams, pursue visions, and speak God's goodness in the language of those who would hear. And may the God who breathed life into creation be your delight. May Christ Jesus give hope to your dreaming. And may the Holy Spirit, your advocate and supporter, set your hearts ablaze with compassion, justice, and peace. Amen. <laughs>